What's up, everybody? I'm David Hain. Welcome to episode 192 of the A to D for Medic to Disciple podcast. If you enjoy this podcast, please like, subscribe, follow, and share the link with your friends. Really, can you do me a favor and get two friends to listen to this episode and then chat with them about it? If you'd like to get our curriculum, you can get the paperback or ebook of From Ashes to Destiny on Amazon. When we come back, we'll get into this episode entitled, The Greatest Poverty. Welcome back to episode 192 of the A to D from Attic to Disciple podcast entitled, The Greatest Poverty. I want to give a big welcome to my friends in recovery from the U.S., South Africa, and Australia for their participation in this group. As before, I'll keep them anonymous, but I'll be saying their answers as if we're having a live group meeting during this episode. Hey guys, how you doing? I want to start with a quote from Mother Teresa. She said, We think sometimes that poverty is only being hungry, naked, and homeless. The poverty of being unwanted, unloved, and uncared for is the greatest poverty. So I want to ask you guys for your reactions to that in the category of have you felt that poverty? Where did you turn to numb or escape it? And how did you find healing from that poverty of being unwanted, unloved, and uncared for, as Mother Teresa said, the greatest poverty? Ben, you ready to start us out? Sure, David. What a fantastic quote from Mother Teresa. In my opinion, that says it all. I think the poverty we see on the outside started from the poverty on the inside. I'm one of the few that has been able to make amends and cultivate a phenomenal relationship with my dad. I'm thoroughly convinced that the wounds of the heart created by parents are some of the most detrimental ones that people get. And as a result, they find themselves in all types of trouble like addiction. I'm pretty sure that was the case with me. Don't get me wrong, I'm not blaming my dad for my bad decisions, but I think if I would have had his presence with me more during those seasons of struggle, especially in my teenage years, it would have helped me not lose all of my 20s to addiction and prison. Thankfully, while I was in prison, my dad started to visit me, and through the grace of God, and both of us forgiving each other and moving forward, we became the best of friends, and we still are. I believe a lot of my recovery journey, now having been sober over 18 years, is due largely in part to the relationship that I have with my father now. I grieve deeply for men and women who do not have that. It has to be painful. However, I'm sure some of them rise up and become great men and women, especially in areas of being a parent. Probably adopting that statement, I will never be the parent my parent was. So, bottom line, I'm pretty sure a lot of my unhealthy addiction-based pursuits were cries from the depths of my soul saying, do you see me? Do you love me? Do you care? And like you said, David, in so many of your teachings, The drugs did their job. They numbed and comforted me for at least a moment, but the payoff was more than I could afford. I'm thankful to be able to say today my mind is clear, my heart is healthy, and by the grace of God, I'm able to be some kind of lighthouse for the hearts of addicts that God sends my way. Great start, Ben. The poverty of having an absentee dad can lead to inexpressible pain that leads to addiction to numb what words can't express. Charlie, what do you think of this topic? Man, David, I can feel this poverty and be surrounded by a crowd of people who are at my house to come visit me. I don't totally understand why that exists, but in my mind, it's strong. I've found ways to live with the anxiety this causes me by putting a name to it, and learning to acknowledge it and accept it. I don't fit it because it's a he's sick thing. In my early years, which I think is some of where this being uncared for stems from, 
The trauma and not having a stable home left me turning to anger through sports, stealing, porn, and a quick self-defense strike mechanism that led me to drugs and needing more than everything. I found healing from it in the way of first accepting that it was a mental or disorder, an illness, and then I put the substance down and got an education on myself at my home group in AA. Once I was in a better place to understand, I was able to see that even though I had what I needed, I was ungrateful. I didn't have what I wanted, my mom and dad, that everyday love from the beginning. So I always felt this isn't good enough. I need more people, more hugs, more everything, including the counterfeit comforts that led me to break. When I found the power of gratefulness and added the true comfort in the world, Jesus, I was able to feel loved and to know, even though I'm sick, I'm still blessed. Wow. Thanks, Charlie, for sharing your journey of being able to make your pain of poverty before you could process it. And by naming it, you could process it and find healing. Eddie, what do you think? Well, I guess I can't really say I've ever felt exactly that way. But when I was younger, a family member told me that when my older brother's father came to get my mom, she hid me in the wardrobe so he wouldn't know she had another child while they were apart. That played on my mind my whole life. I hid it, though, or so I thought. I think addiction gave me a way to deny my poverty. I unintentionally became the life of the party, a way of drawing attention to myself, a way of disguising all my emotions, my way of dealing with whatever suppressed feelings I had, still have. I seem to not be able to remember a lot of emotions. I probably buried them along the way, just like I hid in that closet. But I can sometimes feel them lurking, peeping, moving. The poverty is there. I'm still managing to hide it in all its different forms. Or so I think. There they are in my lack of trust issues, my lack of confidence. They're still there. Shaw. Great share, Eddie. Thanks for the transparency of processing the poverty that is still there in your trust issues. Dante, what do you think of this topic? Well, David, when I was in college, my freshman year was fantastic, at least as far as I was concerned at the time. But in my sophomore year, I grew to a place of loneliness that I never knew was possible. I was generally a good guy. I liked to have fun. But from a dating standpoint, I remained to myself or connected to the person that I was with. I had not been in a relationship for nearly two years and I was growing weary. Long story short, I turned to fornication and that took me down a further path towards sexual addiction and away from God. Have I ever felt real poverty in the worldly sense? No. Have I ever felt poverty of the soul, feeling bankrupt and alone? The answer to that is yes. What did I do? I ran to God's word and to fellowship with others in order to escape that. I had someone ask me recently if I had all my ducks in a row now. Interesting fact is that ducks in a row are actually in motion. I had to keep going to work. I had to keep pursuing intentional relationships with others. I had to keep pursuing what God had for me, even when it was painful. This pursuit is what helped me get all my ducks in a row, slowly restoring my soul and keeping me moving ahead and past the temptations that once had a hold on me. Thanks, Dante. I like your pointing out just that loneliness as being a poverty, but also I really love the idea of ducks in a row still being fluid, still moving, and not something we ignore once we get them lined up, we can't assume they're just going to stay the same forever. Good word, Dante. Harry, 
What do you think about this? David, the poverty I felt was one of being unloved, unwanted, and uncared. I was given up for adoption into a household of abuse. Growing up for me was a nightmare at times. I developed a hatred towards God, which eventually turned to unbelief. Living in a household that had alcoholics, my first addiction was alcohol. It made me brave. It took away the pain. It gave me strength to carry on. The only thing that truly helped was alcohol and then drugs. The drugs made me happy, and I preferred the drugs which made you feel good, like cocaine and ecstasy. I hated the depressant drugs. I didn't do much weed or mandrax. The issue was that I needed it to numb my pain daily. My wife knew about the sadness I faced and warned me about the temporary relief alcohol and drugs gave me. When they wore off, I became a reserved, quiet person who hated the world. Things got very bad as my mental state deteriorated. I developed a full-on anxiety and panic attacks as if I never had any substances in my body. I couldn't deal with the world being sober and clean. My late pastor and our dear friend Rod Shires led my journey of healing by teaching me about love, forgiveness, and letting go and letting God. He made me see the goodness in the world and start believing that God would change my situation if I only allowed him to and keep the faith. Thanks, Harry. Great testimony of finding full and freedom and healing through our, your faith. Good word. Freddie, you want to close this off today? Sure, David. Poverty. Perfect questions for getting to the heart of the matter it reminds me of the Don Henley Eagle song. I've been trying to get down to the heart of the matter, but my will gets weak and my thoughts seem to scatter. But I think it's about forgiveness. Forgiveness. Even if, even if you don't love me anymore. That song takes me back to December 2014, right before hitting bottom. It was Christmas Eve. I was leaving church. It was snowing. I was with my wife and beautiful kids, age 11 and 14. They were next to me, but so far away. All I could think of was getting home to drink. I was miserable. Did I feel unloved and unwanted by others? more than anyone else, and I felt most unloved by myself. Healing came slowly and drinking and weed for 35 years, eight years of Xanax sprinkled in with occasional cocaine and pain meds. It started, my healing did, with 18 days of detox, a week in the nut hut, 30 days in rehab, and four months of outpatient care. It got better. They say it's easier to stay sober than get sober, and that's true for me. God brought me to AA, and AA brought me to God. I found physical, spiritual, and emotional healing by focusing on sharing a positive message from my messes, hope from my hell, so to speak. Recovery, service, and unity are the keys to overcoming the three parts of this disease of addiction for me, the physical, mental, and spiritual. Great way to close this off, Eddie. We can all grow in our healing and help others find their healing through kind words and true compassion as we practice those things, that recovery, service, and unity. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening to this episode of the A to D from Addict to Disciple podcast. If you were saying that's me as you listened, if you're saying, you know what, I think it's time that I deal with my greatest poverty, then it's time to reach out and join a group. You can reach out by messaging me on the link in this podcast or by email at David from A to D at gmail.com or go to my website www.fromatod.org and click on the contact page. I'll do my best to get you plugged into a group either online or near where you live. Tune in Monday for our next episode and as always stay safe and stay resilient.